happen during that time. So in this case, we find that this idea of dependency is very strong with colonized nations, as well colonized nations depend a lot on their former imperial, on their on their colonizer, <laughs> sorry, on their on, on the front of Malaysia, on Britain. That's where Britain started the, the company like Sime Dory. They started off the rubber industry in Malaysia as to which made such a prosperous country itself. So we're seeing that economically, Malaysia at the time was very dependent on the economic policies that the British mandated within our country. So in this sense, we find that if the idea of dependency is so strong and so stringent within that moment of time, if they will decolonize and pass the responsibility to the government almost immediately. We find that it is incapable of the government because, firstly, they are very new to it. As we all know, as I put before the constitution, when we were supposed to have, we were we had to reconstruct the constitution to suit the dynamics of the country and also to suit as to what the country wants and needs. So in a sense, we find that the new best neutral party in this is when they find intelligent people from all over the world to give them the best policies that they can make. So, when it comes to the idea of dependency, as to where these colonized nations were very dependent on this country, and they do not really have the capability on their own to make these uh, policies or to even be neutral with these policies. Because in Malaysia, for example, again, the communists were mostly Chinese and the people on the ground were mostly Malays. So, there was already a friction between these two races. So, we find that if our government were mostly Malay dominated, which the party were mostly Malay dominated, we find that they might have made policies that will be discriminatory towards other races. So in case, as an example, we find that this is the best idea, the best example to show that the idea of dependency on this, or how the Britain social, socially engineered relations will then be best for them to socially engineer us again to make an equal uh, policy that will not be discriminatory to any other races and will be fair and equal to all. Before that, yes. Malaysia asked for independence. Were they fully aware of the consequences of the British leaving at the time? Yeah, they will be, but we have to consider that even if they were fully aware of the consequences at the time, depends on the sustainability, the capability of Malaysia itself, and how it was going to drive the country. The fact that this, even though Malaysians, the uh, government knew that they were going to be independent, that is the idea of sovereignty itself, that they wanted to control. But the fact that the sustainability of the government in running economic policies, as the fact that I told you, that racism and discriminatory policies can still happen in this case, can still happen even though they have asked for it, even though they were given or asked for independence. It's the same thing. It will not only happen under asking for independence, it will, it will also happen under given independence. So in this case, we both find that this is the best way to make the country to have the to have the uh, achieve independence and economic stability within the country itself. Sit down, please. Secondly, is the idea of returning the favor. As we have told you before, these these colonizers, these uh, countries have took advantage and exploited the advantages within its colonized nation. Sit down, please. They have then exploited and profited of these advantages. And when they have done that, most or little to none, or most of the profits went to the person, the country who colonized it. And little were given back to the locals or the people who were living on the ground. They were mostly subjected to slavery. They were all mostly working for the colonized. So therefore, in this case, we find that it is then their responsibility and obligation and justified to be done so because these people suffered under their, under their Room. And that, even though they have benefited from it, it's a very little minority in the place of society that happened at that time. So we say we do not deny that it has given them a, a quite a jump start in the economy when they were going to be decolonized. But the fact that most of them are suffering under the constitution or the ruling of the colon of the colonizer, this means that they should return them the favor of giving them an economic policy that can suit the country and the dynamics in the country itself. And the idea of sustainability as to where if we only allow the country to go with its own course without the help or monitors of the country itself, of the past colonizer, colonizer. This would then give them the leeway to actually direct economies that are discriminatory or unfair to its own citizens. So on our side, the, the idea of dependency and returning the favor is something that's going to be very strong and that this come this colonized nations, even though they wanted the independence, it was mostly on the idea of sovereignty and they even though they have thought about the sustainability 
he questioned the ability of them to do it without the help of the Western relatives. Thank you. It is truistic to, to say and to argue that these countries, these colonized countries are suffering from problems and someone has to do about it. Yes, we consider the fact that they are suffering. But the question comes to why only colonial, uh, colonial powers and why exclusively towards these kind of countries should they be responsible for these colonized countries? And their only contention, uh, their only uh, idea and the metric that they use is that colonial powers once exploited these countries. They took uh, like things like rubber and oil from Malaysia, and though and because of that, Malaysia has the full right to actually get uh, get all the money from uh, British. We don't think this is a suitable metric and a metric that is fair to begin with, because it's not like only these colonial powers get benefit from the colonization. You have to agree to the fact that Malaysia and a lot of other colonized countries also get a lot of benefits from colonization. I can give you a lot of examples. For example, in Malaysia, the structural development that happened, for example, the building of railroads and boats to begin with, which actually is which continuously uh, promotes economic growth, is also built and given by these colonial powers. It's not fair that Malaysia has the right to take the money from Britain just because Britain takes some, some uh, rubber and some oil, but Malaysia doesn't have to pay for all the roads and all the railroads that uh, Britain has given them. And also, we believe it's not actually a form of exploitation because you have to understand when British was in power, when British was controlling Malaysia, Malaysia was a colony. That means that Malaysia was directly under the British rule. That means that all the properties, all the natural resources were also British, uh, the, 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 uh, under the ownership of uh, British because it's literally, Malaysia was literally British soil at that time. So we don't think it's a breach of rights. We don't think it's illegitimate. We don't think it's unfair. But also, the biggest contention is to say that oh, after these colony, uh, colonial powers left, the colon, colonized countries suffered a lot. But we already give a your eye to, to say to you that by, by actually achieving independence and asking for independence from these colonial powers, they already give full consent and full, uh, they created a full informed choice to the possibility of getting this hard and getting difficulties in the economy. But they were they were willing to take this risk. They were willing to put their eggs in this basket anyway. So we think it's not fair that all uh, all of these countries um, suffer. Uh, all, we don't think that countries like British should suffer the failures of the Malaysian government. Before I move on, yes. Even though they have had was meaning to help and aid the industry that was by the colonizers. How are these benefits able to help this country run its own government, create economic policies that will be equal and fair to their own nations? It's unfair to say that all colonized countries economy. Because you have, have to consider the fact that a lot of colonized countries do succeed as well. Because we have to take into consideration and you have to think for a while. If Britain was colonizing a country, they wouldn't leave the country into economic ruins because that would like make them suffer a lot of loss. And that's why they create a lot of roads, railroads and whatnot to actually empower the economic development so that they get a profit as well. And when they left the country, it's not like they took back all the roads, they took back all these railroads and these economic policies. We think that these kind of economic policies still exist. These kind of economic benefits still exist. We, we have a lot of the countries that were colonized but do not face economic problems but just because certain countries have this kind of uh, uh, difficulty and face this uh, kind of difficulty we don't think that it's british it's the fault of the british but it's the fault of these countries themselves please explain why malaysia can prosper as an economic uh, country even though yeah uh, we were a colonized country but just because timor leste was a colonized country and they're not doing so well now this uh, country has the legitimate right to uh, the property, right? 
well now oh, talking about the metric of ownership towards this kind of uh, towards the property right we don't take history just because past instances past actions should be a metric to uh, to measure whether you have a legitimate right towards another state or not because using this logic using the logic that oh i was part of british so i own everything that british has using your logic that means every ex soviet country owns a part of the economy of russia we don't think that is a that is a true characterization we don't think that's even logical to begin with but also you have to understand that um, it's not like 100, 100% of all the economic problems suffered by these colonized countries are because of the colonial countries. Yes, maybe the colonial powers left the country and the country like suffered, but it's not a direct, it's not a direct factor, it's not a direct cause towards this kind of uh, uh, downfall economic problems. We think it's just a correlation, just because it, it was a coincidence that they left and this kind of problems happened. We don't think this kind of uh, country should, should suffer. First of all, how we, we think the biggest harm from of putting the obligation and putting the burden onto Western, uh, this kind of Western countries, this colonial powers only, we think the biggest harm is recolonization. First of all, how recolonization can happen? We think that these countries are more likely going to actually recolonize these countries instead of having the burden to ensure that this country, which is not even their country, to prosper as an economy. As, a, as an economy. We think countries like british are more likely to going to ex absorb these kind of countries into their political system and actually like like colonize them rather than to have the burden to ensure that these kind of countries can prosper and in this instance even harmful people on the ground think that these colonial powers are doing a better job than the incumbent government which even uh, it, it further and incentivizes recolonization to happen and when recolonization happens we think the biggest harm is how you harm the the efforts and the sovereignty, uh, the things that you have been like fighting for for so long, for all all the suffering that these individual individuals in the past had to go through to get independence, now it gets harmed. But second, how we think this itself, the policy itself, is an exploitation towards colonial powers because we think these colonies can exploit countries like British just because they they have this kind of moral uh, high ground. They think they say, oh, we suffered because of you. Now they have the full legitimacy take every uh, every uh, to have the legitimacy and to have a leverage towards the british government and we believe that exploitation towards these kind of governments can happen and we do not accept this kind of harms we don't think it's legitimate don't go with their only trade off which is oh um, this kind of problem uh, are being uh, are being suffered by people on the on colonial uh, colonized country because we think other countries other societies things like world bank and imf also can help in our countries. Alright, thank you very much. Now we have the We, we think it's unfair for you to come into someone's house and make it dirty, put all your things in the house and take all the food from that person and then leave it and don't do anything about it in the future. We think it's important for a country that has exploited the economy and took all the profits from that specific country to leave it as it is and never give help to that country, especially when the country has probably helped that help a con uh, the West develop further in, in the future, right? So first of all, a few battles. Number one, they want to talk about how countries, or oh, suddenly these countries have actually got advantages from colonization. We don't think it's true. All these benefits outweigh the total harm of what has happened, uh, of the outcomes of colonization. We think that things like people have been denied education, education has been segregated, and we think that these people have received a lot of harms, which is social engineering, where there's a certain stigma that exists because of this colonization that happens. We don't think small advantages, like only railroads and uh, and things like uh, roads, aren't, aren't, I don't exactly outweigh all the harms that have come from colonization. So we think that these benefits have all, only been created 
to the West advantage, for instance, the British advantage. They are only built in specific places that create an advantage to the British. They're not built everywhere. They, they aren't a justifiable, uh, they aren't a justifiable structure for the country to start off from. You have to understand these countries start from nothing. I think a road or a rail, railway isn't enough for these countries to continuously develop and, ex and make a whole new economy to begin. Thirdly, you must talk about how all these countries want independence, therefore they build they uh, they build their own uh, economy because of that. It's not justifiable. Why? Because obviously these countries want to be independent. It's unfair for you to put a whole burden onto them because they, the only way to achieve independence is for them to ask for it. This is unfair. Why? Because these people are left with nothing. They are left with nothing because of all they, the British take all the profits that they've gotten and uh, they're all absorbed by the West in the first place. How do you expect these people to start off from nothing and just because they actually want to achieve independence, we think it's unfair to do so. Thirdly, they want to talk about how history cannot be the metric to determine future actions. Number one, we think that yes, history is always used, either, uh, always used to determine uh, determine things like action in the future. This is why Japan doesn't have a standing army because of things they did in World War II. We think that these are certain examples of why history is used to pay back a certain country for their actions. We think the responsibility in this case is supposed to go to the West because of all the exploitation and all the harm that they have brought to the country that was colonized in the first place. And thirdly, they want to talk about the idea of recolonization. But we think that checks and balances already exist in status quo that the UN will obviously intervene when they see chances of recolonization happening. And they also want to talk about how the people will be there for influence, and these people will suddenly want to take the West back instead of having their own government. No, we don't think so. Why? Because we think that these people have already seen the suffering that they have gone on, gone, gone through under colonization. So when they have already gone through that suffering that the colonization has done to them, we don't think that they would want to be recolonized again. And so moving on to our <coughs> So we have to look at the comparison on what happens under both sides. The, so look at the economic standing. We think that these the economic policies of the country won't be as good and won't be as to the maximum potential as they can be uh, the, as that can be reached, right? Why? Because it's a, there are an unfair disadvantage to begin with. Disadvantage stem from the whole colonization process in the first place. All the profits have been taken by the West, and it's only, only fair for them to actually get uh, funding or get intelligence in order to build the economic policies for the long term sustainability, right? So, the reason for this is that these people will colonize in the first place. There's also a reason why the country is dependent. This means that the country has no idea on how to create good economic policies that can sustain their people in the future. Why has this dependency been created? We already told you that dependency has been created because of the fact that the West has never allowed the country to make its own policy, has never allowed the country to take the benefits from whatever they have, whatever, um, whatever resources that the country has had. It's also better for the country in itself. Why? You have better policies and you're better able to manage the country as a whole because now you're being helped in the process. You're being helped because they're giving you payback for the for the way that you have helped the West in the past. So you have to look at the long term. Uh, you, can, you have to look at things in the long term, right? So in the long run, our goal is to make sure that the country can, that, uh, can operate on its own at a fast rate and the country can operate on its own for the good of the people on the ground because they are the people that are most affected in this scenario. So with a good economy, uh, so now people on the ground, it it allows them the capability to be at a better stand, at a better stage as what they are now. We have to look at Malaysia. It's been really hard for Malaysia to come back from that. Yes, they have a lot, they had a lot of help, but that's exactly the scenario. You have to create, uh, you have to allow the country, and you have to give the country a step up in order to get an equal playing field as to the countries in the West. We don't think that uh, we think that, that should happen in this space. So secondly, a politics, right? The social engineering and, and the dynamic in the country. We have to look at the example of Rwanda with the Hutus and the Tutsis. In this case, when the when this came in, they have created a certain stigma between the two ethnic groups, and we think that this is an, this is an example on how possibly it could make it could, they could use this stigma as a disadvantage and create discriminatory economic policies towards these people. We don't want these things to happen. How can the West, who claim to be liberal and claim to be a, a uh, who claim to be advocates for human rights and equality for everyone be at a position where they can prevent these kinds of discriminatory economic policies from happening but don't do anything to prevent it. We think that funding and intelligence uh, in, in making these economic policies can actually help these people progress further from what they can, what, what they would have done in the past. So we think that this also 
uh, we think that when you want to be progressive, right? So when you look at the people in the group, what happens to them? So after being exploited for so long, it's really hard for them to maintain a long and sustainable good economic state, right? So it's needed because we think that organic change is hard to happen in these kinds of scenarios. Why? Because for so long, they've been dependent on the policies that have been implemented by the people that colonize them. It's easier to achieve uh, economic stability if you help them. We don't think that the West has anything to lose in this scenario. And no harm can come to why? Because we think that these people already develop and they already have enough money to sustain their own people. We don't get that. We think that it's a win-win scenario. The West has nothing to lose, and the, the former colonies have everything to gain. We think that we're willing to make this trade-off because we don't think that any harm can come to the West to begin with. We think that it's uh, we think that the people who are affected or the people on the ground who have been continuously exploited in the past should be given the chance to maximize their economic potential, should be given the chance to actually progress further from what they would have progressed without economic policy. We think that it's unfair for you to take advantage but never really repay them in the future, uh, never really repay them for what they've done. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, so let's understand the value of consent that has existed throughout history and why that's not a legitimate metric as to why accountability must take place. Let's understand that pre-liberty or pre-freedom, a lot of countries have consented to the consequences of their past uh, colonial powers leaving. And individuals who have recognised that if the British leave, I'll probably lose a lot of resources or they've already exploited too much of my resources so I can't go back or go back. But the individuals still decided to take the risk because they decided that's part of their liberty and that's the mark they want to make in the global arena. That's, that's the, something they wanted to prove. Given that those are the circumstances that prevailed in the past, should it then mean that the consent is no longer valid and accountability must take place? We failed to see why government thinks that this is a valid metric. We told you why history cannot be a metric. But regardless, let's deal with a few issues within today's debate. The first issue we're going to deal with is this idea of social engineering because this, being, this seems to be stressed out by both speakers on self government. They try to tell us how it's very important for a neutral arbiter to come in and make economic policies that are just generally raising bias and things like this. But the problem with that argument is that that's not an argument against economic policies or economic reforms that need to take place, but that's an argument against intervention on a humanitarian basis. It's not that these individuals have a certain degree of liability because that's a liberty that any country is entitled to. That's exactly why Malaysia is still allowed to pass things like Bumi Putra rights or the policies that enforce Bumi Putra rights because that's, that, that's exactly what liberty does to you. It allows you the opportunity to make policies even if it's biased. That's exactly why external parties such as the United Nations need to come to consensus before they get involved. It's not necessarily something that one country has a liability over just because it wants to do you. It's not causal, ladies and gentlemen. But even if they were to change something, how is it still necessarily harmful? This means that the organic change that the pre, like, pre, pre colonial powers necessarily wanted to have can, cannot necessarily happen because it's not changed on their own terms. 
not something we fight for, but it's something an external party enhances. Therefore, is liberty necessarily granted? We really get to prove the liberty. We don't think so. Therefore, all, all efforts to gain that liberty becomes counterproductive in the eyes of the people. Anyway, second argument they had, second issue we had with that case was the idea of how natural resources are exploited. Therefore, the mandate this. Yeah, we understand and we concede that to a large extent of time, the individuals have used up some resources within countries like Malaysia. But the problem is this. Did they really use up everything and leave us with nothing? We think this is a false characterization. The reason for this is because Malaysia is still one of the like, uh, palm oil producers in the world, right? But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, what they did was it so bad to the point they still have to be fully accountable for all the economic recessions that take place. This is the question that I'm going to answer. And the reason for this is because they are expecting all these countries to be completely liable over economic recessions that are not necessarily causal to the leaving of the colonies. And the reason for that is because a lot of things such as corrupted leaders or corrupted governments could also lead to economic recessions, but there's no way to draw the specific metric because under the of the house, it's, it's, it's like blanket policy, right? Regardless of what happens, as long as it's an economic failure, regardless of its cause, these individuals are accountable. Then the only reason to this is that, oh look, what happened is, uh, colonial powers didn't allow previous colonies to necessarily obtain knowledge and things like this. Again, this is a false characterization because in order for their companies to work, in order for the investments to work, they required labor that came from that particular country. More than that, that's exactly why these countries were colonized because labor is just that cheap in those countries. That's exactly why the British went to India. That's exactly why the Spaniards went to Philippines. In those circumstances, it is more likely that these individuals have already obtained or actually been exposed to a sufficient amount of knowledge in order to continue enhancing whatever they want to do, right? In those circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, is it then fair for this colonial powers to take responsibility? We don't think so. In the foundation that they allows individuals to take was fair compensation for them leaving. But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, we also granted them the liberty and allowed them to realize their responsibilities even if, even though it was the hard way through. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, let's also analyze this idea of uh, whether or not it was fair for countries to leave and not knowing not let any individuals uh, necessarily have to run an economy. We don't think this is also true because we have to understand the responsibility of a sovereign state. Sure, we have to concede like in countries such as Greece or countries like the United States, the Great Depression, there are individuals who have suffered a lot of economic recessions, but what, what happened was with the state, like the global community generally allowed them to reform and try to make things better because that was their responsibility as a sovereign state. If you're going to demand sovereignty, you have to deal with consequences like sudden economic failure that were to happen later on after you've already established your country, after you've already established certain policies. This is a responsibility that is in so entitled to, but more than that, ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what makes that a country to begin with. Therefore, let's make a comparison to the government's case. They're telling us that it's only fair for individuals or for, for like former colonial powers to take responsibility of actions when it's necessary causal. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, they tell us that it's not fair for these individuals to just bail out like that and not allow that certain basic level of sovereignty or liberty that they want to grant to their former colonies. In those circumstances, how is it then fair or how is it then uh, this form of liberty that they want to grant in the first place. But nevertheless, let's take a look at the responses we had towards my leader of opposition speech. They tried to tell us that, oh, exploitation of these colonial powers, that not necessarily going to happen because they don't opt into it. But the problem with that, and the reason why uh, recolonization is extremely probable, is because these are countries that generally don't want to uh, uh, like act out of responsibility. It's highly unlikely that the United States wants to suddenly fund Philippines because they feel they have a moral obligation to. We always have vested interest behind every form of like, uh, like, like bilateral trade agreement or be, uh, behind every form of like general international intervention to begin with. Given those circumstances, it's only fair or it's more likely that these individuals actually want to make certain reforms by allowing uh, their own terms onto these conditions, right? You need to say, if I'm going to pay or compensate for your for your development, it's, highlight, it's more likely that I want a sufficient amount of benefit that will come at a sufficient trade-off. In those circumstances, it's more far more likely that these individuals, at the worst case, if they're not going, uh, uh, the best case, if they're not going to recognize, they're going to demand a lot of things which disallows countries or former colonies to ever liberalize or to ever gain that form of liberty or sovereignty over their people. And it's very important that we defend this because we don't allow these individuals to necessarily take that burden because that burden will be a certain level of execution to fully achieve. In those circumstances, it's high, more likely on the other side of the house with the enforced rhetorics that uh, as a burden, uh, as a burden is brought to you, you need to execute that, that burden in any way you want as long as it's executed. We mean to say it's far more likely to give you a state opportunity or further exploitation is bound to happen because this is generally the benefit that they, they can accrue from interventions and these generally conditions that they can impose on these individuals. But the best case scenario is government. 
they allow individuals to take accountability over the, their previous colonial, uh, colonies. But the but harm that is, we don't have far more like individuals want to exploit the opportunity to allow for benefits under their side and vested interests to take place. For all the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, side of opposition has never been found enough to take place. Okay. Questions I'm going to answer today is basically this debate was being brought down to what is the best way then for these former colonies to achieve economic stability. And now, as I've been talking to you, we, the, the only best way for us to achieve economic stability is by the help of the, it's by the moral obligation of the help of the West to find our colonial powers. And I'll let that explain to you why. We've only provided to you some reasons as to why that we wanted that the West has an obligation to help these former colonial powers like Malaysia and the Philippines and Indonesia and Vietnam and stuff like that, right? Because of several reasons that they never want to engage in. First, we told you about the idea of independence, the culture of dependency. Well, they, when the British colonized Malaysia, when they came into Malaysia, Malaysia was solely dependent on Malaysia. Malaysia was solely dependent on the British powers because the British owned Malaysia. And to them, it's okay for them, it's okay for the British to own Malaysia. But in fact, it's not. There's a reason why colonizing is illegal. There's a reason why countries don't colonize other countries anymore. But second, the second reason why we told you why they have this moral obligation is because of the political work behind it. And we told you that even if it's not, even if history is not a metric as to why there's an obligation, we tell you that it's tip for fact. And I'll later explain to you why, right? We're not denying the sovereignty of the countries, right? We just merely say that it's okay for them to help, for them to choose to help, us, uh, to choose to receive the help or not because of the past, because of things that will take a little experience. Right? Sit down. Let's, look, let's clear up a few things before we go on to the clash. Number one, they told you that Malaysia had a lot of benefits. So called British colonizing Malaysia was the that to begin with. They gave an example of these railroads and, um, and this. Um, and this uh done and all that. So we told that even, even, even uh, so they told you that those were the kind of benefits that Malaysia accrued and British never took that back to Britain. Clearly, because British was the one who was in power at the point in time. But come with that benefit, came with the fact that who made that then came the question of who made this railroad. The people in Malaysia, the Malays and Chinese, were the one who died making these railroads, were the one who suffered from the benefits that the British accrued. Did Malaysia ever got the benefit of what the British wanted to do with railroads? No, the British made the railroads because they wanted to transfer the um pop, uh, the palm oil and Demons, all that to other places, right? But second, clearly, they told you that, the, that the, clearly the whole point was that the British should not suffer because of the failure of other countries. We told you that number one, we told you that Mal Malaysia shouldn't have suffered, the countries like Malaysia and, um, and the Philippines should not have suffered because of the colonized powers in itself. They left the country just like they left the country with zero, with nothing to learn, with nothing as a as a like cushion to fall back on, and hence why the country suffered. We tell you that the act of put of taking out of going up from the country in itself is the reason why the country suffered. So hence there is a moral obligation for them to come and read about what the history has done. Sit down. But even if it's not justified, why is it okay for tit for that to happen? It's okay because the West, most of the countries in the West already have a already have a stable economy where they are planning on their own economy. Hence, it's okay for them to go and find a little bit of money for other countries to have a prosperous economy. We don't see anything wrong with a with a Western country helping a former colonized powers, even if it, even if they were colonized or not. We tell them that it's okay for them to do so. But even then, it's being better for former colonized, for example, British to help Malaysia because of the suffering that they've developed before. But before I move on, sure. Why should the current British government suffer a burden because of something that government hundreds of years ago did? Why do people now suffer because of the, what the British did in the past? See what's that, guys? You, if you have to suffer, then 
then we tell them it's okay for them to suffer. We don't think British will suffer because of the economic health that they can provide, because of the intelligence services that our mechanism has provided to you. Let's say the first, um, and before that, let's, before that, they also told you that not all suffering, uh, not all formal colonial health suffer because of colonization. It's merely a coincidence. We don't think it's a coincidence. We don't think Malaysia just fell down like that because of the coincidence. It's not coincidence. British left, Japan took over, and, 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 um, and made it worse for it. But let's make the first clash about recolonization. The question is, is it probable or not for recolonization to happen? Clearly, they didn't understand our mechanism because they tried to, tell, they tried to argue that it violates a country's sovereignty and the, uh, the act of consent isn't really there because of what history has done, what because of history in the past. And second, they argue that the West can exploit because now they have control over that country's economy. Number one, we don't know that my cousin has the idea of consent. For example, if my British people go there, huh? And major chooses not to help because they think that they, that they think that they can help their own economy by itself. Everything's fine. They can reject the British help or not. But if they choose to come and help, we can the second point about this chat about how about how there are about how there are isolations that can that overlooks the idea itself. So Alex would come and told you about how there are states and the other uh negotiation parties like the UN that can come and check whether they are really exploiting the economy or not. Clearly, there's a difference between a person, between a country funding and a country exploiting the economy. There is a stark difference between that. But even then, we told you that we have we have we have uh, intelligence services experts that try to that try to help and regulate the policies that they try to come up with. But even then, they want the countries, but also, they want countries to have their own liberty because apparently on our side, we don't allow countries to have their own liberty and have their own freedom. We tell them they still have the free will that they want to choose or not because it will not stop because it doesn't because the only the economic policy can provide is for them to reach economic stability and we don't see any problem in that in itself. Right? But before I move on, last one, Joe. Are you okay with the global that was the reason why we want the West to help because some people are dependent and hence why we need the help to come and help them. Once we reach economic stability, once we realize that these economic aspects came and like regulate and they realize that these countries like Malaysia can go on by themselves, we tell them that then they can reach out back to the funds. And Alex please explained this already. Let's look at the last part about how history has a history as magic. Can history really be a magic as to whether the world goes has an obligation or not. We tell that history can and is a magic because if it's not, because, because of what's happened in the past, our justification to you was because Malaysia has suffered and it's okay for the British to come and help and Malaysia chooses not to attack the British. Then it's fine. We tell you that the liberty of the country will still be maintained. The sovereignty of the country will still be maintained. We don't see a lack of contact not being an impartial party as to how the, as to how the West can go and help this country. Right? Because we have to understand by the end of the day, their side, this allows this allows countries to gain help from countries that cause the countries to suffer. Our set provides to you a strategic a strategic way for these people to come and help countries that they um, that they prolong suffering from. And we tell you at the end of the day, the best way for us to create economic stability is for the West to help these countries in the South. And that's why go inside government. Okay, and we have the last speech as well. Mr. Speaker, I completely understand that if someone came to my house, took all my food and money and leave, that's busted. But this is not the debate because the way the West came to us, utilized all our natural resources and developed money, and it's not that the West left just that was in one night stand. Instead, we asked them to leave. We killed your officers. We protested. We chased them out. But now we want them back. Who do you think you are to not put the blame on someone that you once chased before? It's not like they left it, just ask them to leave. Let's move on to the several issues in this debate. 
Number one, how do you see that the West have obligations or not, or what metrics do we use? Number two, what happened during colonization that affects the former colonies? And number three, how can we help the former colonies if we do not take their policy? But before that, right, certain, like, some rebuttals that does not have any issues. Whether history is the legitimate metrics or not. We think, like, it is not the legitimate metrics to use as to say someone is responsible for something. Because if it is true that history is that is the legitimate metrics, then the current government of the West should not have the burden and should not be blamed because the colonization that happened was that the past British government. Therefore, if you really believe the principle to say that, that the past is legitimate to, uh, as, a, as a reason to say someone is responsible, therefore this current government is not responsible for it. The current state of the West should not be burdened for something that they did not do, ladies and gentlemen. Number two, colonization was not something wrong back at that time. Therefore, if you still want to use history as a legitimate metric to see that someone is wrong, then we don't think you're winning this debate. Because colonization was not something wrong at the other, and colonization was something that happened because of war. Therefore, you cannot blame colonization because colonization happens without someone else to say it is wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Before let's move on to several the first issue in this debate. How do we say that the West have an obligation or not? And what metrics do we use? Governments say that West exploited their former colonies. So the question whether the West is over the economic harm that their former colonies are facing. We don't think they are complicit over the economic harm that exists. Why? Because the West already granted independence that the former colonies demanded for. At that point of time, they already disassociate them, disassociate themselves from the West. The only task that must be fulfilled by the West was to stop colonization, to grant freedom, no expectation. We ultimately reject the characterization to say that the West have the burden and they have the responsibility to ensure their former colonies have to, uh, their former colonies economic stability. It's not the main burden for, it's not the main burden of the West to ensure economic stability. We don't, it's the main thing that, that, that uh, the West have to do so. But because they, because they colonized countries like Malaysia, Timor Leste, Indonesia, those countries lost their natural resources like, like Malaysia itself, how Malaysia lost its natural resources like Brava. Okay, first of all, we agree that the colonization of the West did impose harm, for even, even if it imposed harm. But the moment a state demand a decolonization, like Malaysia demanded independence from British, we believe that the former colonized do not want to be related, controlled at all by the West. So who is responsible for the economic harm then? That's the biggest question. The political party that fought for independence are supposed to be responsible for it because they promised to the people on the ground that they can enter development, that they can ensure stability in all aspects. And then they demanded, they demanded independence from British itself. Therefore, they are responsible for whatever that's happening after that. We think, ladies and gentlemen, they explicitly volunteered to be responsible. Therefore, we don't think that they we don't think that the demand for independence was only to get sovereignty, it was also to disassociate, them, to disassociate themselves completely from the West. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we do think that it is the it is it is the best metrics. It is the best thing to say that the West have obligation. So the two metrics that they use: number one, whether the West completely over the economic harm or not, and number two, whether they have the West have direct relation to that state or not. We don't think those two criteria was met under their proposal because the West did not cause the harm, the economic recession, whatever that happens in Timor Leste, and the West have no direct relation anymore to that state. So we don't think they have the obligation. Assuming but not considering if the West did cause the economic, if the West is directly related to the country up until now, we still think that the best, the best scenario is harmful. Because again, we talk about how some minimal form of colonization will happen. Why do we say so? Because the moment you demand West to give aid, the West have the power to say that this aid comes condition. That means you have to do, do, do you have to do this, 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 this in your economic policies. So, so and to supervise the economic policies. Therefore, there is direct control over what that state can do, ladies and gentlemen. We think this is bad, this is colonization. And we reject this characterization to say because just saying that the United Nations is there to actual colonization will not happen again. This is not another war, my dear. This is a war that you can't see. This is a this is a form of a, 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 this is a form of colonization that is very harmful and subliminal. Number two, we say it's harmful because it creates a precedence to allow all state or governing former colonists to shift responsibility. Now state become complacent to say to see Mr. Speaker that whatever happens right now because of my fault is because of the form of uh, because of my because of our colonies fault. We think ladies and gentlemen this is, is very important. the conclusion issue is now we don't think the West have obligation because number one they don't have any relation anymore to that state number two they did not cause the harm is the state that caused is the state value ladies and gentlemen before we come to the second issue yes we don't think that complacency is such a big issue because we think that the state in this Eventually, give up and leave the dependency of the British. The British people here, I think, this already comes to 
at the same time, you still allow these states to put the blame on former on former uh, on US because they did this in general. So for all the for that reason, you can keep continuously using that reason to say that they're failing not because of their own quality, but because of the West. We think that's the reason, and that's how because you keep on shifting responsibility. And how is that good? How is that the state itself? Second issue is this: what happened during colonization that the former colonies that that raises this issue, right? Governments say that exploitation of natural resources. We think British investment is not really an exploitation. They were owned by British itself. Therefore, this is not a form of exploitation. They have the right to take all these natural resources because they were owned by British itself. We say the West have done what they are supposed to during that time. They built infrastructures, they built economic policies that, that, that is good enough for them to be developed themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, but then the local political party of that state claimed that it was not good enough. Now they decided to stop depending on the on the West at that point of time. Now you are saying that they need to depend on the West again. We think, ladies and gentlemen, even if exploitation that occurred during colonization does not have anything to do with what's happening right now. Uh, yeah, even if you want to, see, you still want to say that exploitation is the, uh, exploitation that happened with us. We believe that exploitation that occurred during colonization does not have anything to do with what's happening right now. Number one, we believe because it is the state. Itself. The West colonized many states, Malaysia, Indonesia, Timor Leste, India. If all other states can be better and be good, ladies and gentlemen, why not? And then, because of the particular country that Timor Leste failed, we want to say and generalize that because of the West, the West colonization, all these countries are failing. The conclusion to this issue is this. The colonization does not have anything to do with what's happening right now because the state that is governing right now was the one that failed to do something and to do good, ladies and gentlemen. The quality of the state right now should be questioned, not the past. We think we better look at the, the right now rather than the past. For all the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, we're very proud to take this debate. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, this debate was a value judgment debate on whether or not, like post colonial days, should colonies necessarily have the burden to be accountable for economic crises that were to happen in their previous colonies. With that, ladies and gentlemen, the side of government gave us four arguments. The first, of which was how we have a responsibility because the people on the ground have been over dependent and not able to stand on their own two feet. Secondly, they told us how these colonial powers stripped everything off these individuals, not leaving enough skilled, labor, skilled laborers to allow development to continue. But thirdly, they told us how people suffered during the process of colonization, therefore, these individuals must be accountable. And lastly, they told us how social change can happen when a neutral arbiter or when an ex colony will come back and change things. The problem with all of these arguments are that number one, it's not mutually exclusive. First of all, they try to tell us how dependency is going to severely be limited on their side of the house. But then they, again, they still tell us how it's extremely important for dependency that's already been existing to continuously be fueled by more dependency because now we are from external parties. And then they tell us, oh, one day these colonial powers have to leave anyway. But then again, that's a vicious cycle over and over again because these individuals are going to continuously de be dependent. How does that change anything on their side of the house? We fail to see any grounding of that argumentation. But secondly, we told us how there's not in skilled laborers, so these individuals must make change. And we told you consecutively, of, like the last speakers of opposition, how these like highly unlikely because these are individuals who have been exposed to economic pro uh, uh, economic strategy and policies that the British already imposed. But more than that, we told you how these are individuals who have a natural responsibility to look for more viable economic policies because that's what a government does, and that's how you make your country a lot better. But the third thing they told us was, oh, people suffer. Therefore, the state must necessarily be accountable. In that case, ladies and gentlemen, that is not necessarily an option, is it? If you're going to find individuals trying to be accountable for deaths they had caused, then it shouldn't be an option. These are individuals who need to be accountable. 
yet they still allow this option to exist. I mean to say, if I don't need closure for individuals who have died building railroads, then it's okay, I don't need your help. But if I do need closure, then sure, come back. This argument is not necessarily causal to why an economic development must take place. If to prove us the exclusivity in that. But lastly, they tell us how social change can better be enforced. Yet at the same time, ladies and gentlemen, they try to tell us how they want to maintain the constitution that a country has necessarily kept. I mean to say, ladies and gentlemen, there's also concession on the their side, the external party or former, former colonial powers is able to make changes within that country. What does this tell you about the liberty and sovereignty that these countries have earned? independence. It tells you that it's non-existent. It tells you that as a house, as much as neutral actors such as the United Nations can continue regulating things, but, but uh, like all these economic reforms can lead to things like social change and social engineering. These are the kinds of harms that they've also considered and it has the house. We tell you, even if UN steps in, conditions can be imposed because they can be masked down as things like economic strategy. I mean to say they can get away, or colonial can get away with changing things that happen on the ground. What does this mean in, in essence, right? We told you the harm to this is that the value of independence loses its like its dignity to begin with, right? We told you lose the value of independence in the eyes of the people, in the eyes of your people, in the eyes of the international community. But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, we told you how the imposition of like foreign values are more likely going to happen because they have the power to do so, because they have vested interest in changes that want to happen within the countries that you want to change. But lastly, ladies and gentlemen, we told you how recolonization is still as probable even the United Nations steps in because this infringement of indoctrination of those values can still exist under outside the house. We have to see a response coming from outside government of why these, these harms are not necessarily equivalent to the benefits they accrue from the side of the house. We tell that the Senate of the House has been necessarily stringent in today's debate because they haven't been debated the even if. They failed to tell us why even if history was not a metric, why it's not okay for state to be necessarily liable. We told you because past consent had existed, these individuals must take full accountability for the things they've already agreed to. Under those metrics, ladies and gentlemen, side of opposition have never been proud to say that sovereignty and liberty is something that you must account to yourself to and you should take full accountability of. The angle of both houses was to allow the colonized countries to be able to manage or govern their country in the best way possible, as to where a stable economy can be achieved so that they can stand on their own feet, as they have seen. But the best way to achieve this goal on site government and what we have presented to you is that colonial powers should actively fund the economy to help the economic policies of the, of the decolonized country through a neutral party and also jumpstart their economies because they have exploited before and therefore to reduce dependency on them on a constant basis. So this means when Malaysia is decolonized from Britain, they can actually survive on their own two feet without the British help or industrialized help that they have given within Malaysia itself. So what are the issues that have been presented in this debate today and how the side government has preempted their case in the best way possible? Firstly, why is it an obligation and is it an obligation or not for the colonial powers? On government justification, is the colonial nation has been very dependent on policies that have been set by past colonial powers and the colonial powers has exported and they have given less benefit towards the local and then thirdly, the, the sustainability of helping them is a lot more is a lot more better for the, for the decolonized country instead of letting them stand on their own two feet immediately. For example, and he's talked about, about biased economic policies, and we find that it is tolerated by the nature itself. As to was it a problem in that sense anyway? As to if it's a biased uh, economic policy, for example, bullying policy that gives you five percent off for every property you buy, can be tolerated by both the Chinese and the Indians. As to why is that a problem within today's context? If the nation has tolerated it already, why is it a problem? In the fact that it is okay to be run to their own country and to be okay to be accepted. This is no problem at all. We will find out how this is against our case. On opposition justification, this is the first thing. They say that history is not a legitimate metric. But we have told you before that he is a legitimate metric because firstly, it is very dependent on the past economic industries, um, 
within the, the decolonizing country. And for example, Japan has, has, has been bombed by America. And America took the responsibility to actually help them in, in their building up of the country itself. So in this sense, we can see that their actions have responsibilities. No matter a century later or two centuries or two centuries later, this history will still be there and it is still a fact. No matter whether the current government did it or the past government did it, even though George Bush had even though the the intervene in the friendship of US in a lot of countries, from so Iraq and Afghanistan. They are still taking responsibility for that, even though it was a past president's responsibility. So we don't see as how this is a logical sense in today's debate. Second, what about sovereignty? The definition of sovereignty is inter inter intervention without consent. I was saying that if the countries do consent to this sort of aid, then it is legitimate for these past colonial powers to actually aid them in this context. Third, about the idea of recolonization, how it still can happen under the first today's century. So firstly, national check, and, uh, national check and balance has been obligated by a lot of bodies, international bodies and national bodies. For example, the UN. They have very stringent policies on what recolonization, so it cannot happen again. Not only that, if they say that indoctrination of values can just happen under their case, but the main contradiction on their point is they're saying that Countries can stand on their own two feet. They have to self-identify and actualize in their own state. Then how can indigenous values happen again? So we we'll see the, the link between these two claims. Second, as to how the as to the third speaker, he talked about the relations and how they have no direct correlation as of now. But we're saying that they do have a direct relation in the past and still now because they have had done this and it's still affecting these people on the ground in current status quo. So it does affect the people on the ground and it does still have made them suffer or make them have stringent policies that or, or make them suffer under their rule. Then we find that it is their responsibility to then give them the, the aid and give them the, the aid to help them stand back up together on their own two feet. Thank you. Thank you very much.